All right, so the art of protecting secrets. So today we're going to talk about cryptography, um, which is a big scary word, but do not worry. It's not, it's not that crazy, um, which is basically how we encrypt data in order to make sure that outside people don't see it. We want them to look at it and think like I just showed you with steganography where it's just a JPEG um, or it's just like a bunch of random data that's in there and not be able to get anything useful out of it. Uh, we're going to go, we're going to review kind of the AAA uh, that we talked about last time, which was, you know, the authentication, authorizations, accountability, all that stuff. Um, and then we are going to talk about how we can obscure data, which is that data obfuscation. Uh, so kicking off cryptography. So all cryptography is, is taking the data that we have, think of it like a um, like a conveyor belt. So we have our data coming in and then we have our algorithm. So these algorithms could be, um, could be MD5, it could be, um, we could use like an MD5 hash in order to kind of mix it up. But at the baseline, we just have an algorithm here. Our data comes in, it goes through our little machine, and then it spits out just kind of randomness. So if we said, hello, my name is TJ, on the other side, it would be like QR number 247927, okay? So that's what cryptography is. And as far as the Security Plus exam is concerned, um, you're going to need to know a couple things. You're going to need to know about um, symmetric and asymmetric encryption, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. Um, you're going to have to know, um, you are going to have to know like the different um, algorithms that are out there. Uh, and we're going to call cover quite a few of them today. And the questions are going to be more like, what would you use to set up a VPN tunnel? And you'll have four options and it'll be like MD5. And it's like, well, that has no, that doesn't really make sense. Like that doesn't like a, that's really old and it's not really used anymore. Um, and then they'll have some kind of off the wall ones. And then you'll have, um, one of the ones that are under kind of that VPN protocol. And I did put a study guide up in the resources area for the Jason Dion videos, and he breaks down every single one of those um, that you'll need to know for the actual Security Plus. Um, but like I said, we're going to cover um, most of them today that you'll need to know. Um, and I put a bunch of videos up there too that talks about kind of um, just a couple of the different most common things. Like, And I'm, I'm actually going to put up the video. Uh, we'll watch it that talks about um, public key exchange, which is how the internet works in order to share secrets. So I'll be showing that video today and that'll really help you understand um, PKI, the public key infrastructure. So when it comes to, um, and a couple other words that you need to know for ciphers is you have just your um, standard data and then you have your ciphertext, which is where we take the regular data that we had and then it goes through that algorithm. The end result is your ciphertext, okay? So that's what you're gonna have um, after you've gone through whatever algorithm that you choose, okay? There's two types of encryption. So the first one is symmetric, okay? With symmetric algorithms, the key that is used in order to encrypt everything is the same on both of them, okay? So with symmetrics, we have a pre-shared key. So again, just break these words down. If you've never heard the word pre-shared key, that's fine. Break that down. Pre means before. Shared is we're both gonna have a copy of it. And key, like a door lock, right? Because in order to read our ciphertext, we have to put it back through our machine, but this time we have to put our key in it to turn that machine on, so that way it can spit out our plain text, okay? Does that make sense? So when you think of symmetric algorithms, you need to think that there is just a single key that is shared, okay? So symmetric is pre-shared key. Asymmetric key uses more than one. So in this case, um, I'm going to go into my computer and I'm gonna say, I want you to generate keys for me. It's gonna generate two different keys that I can use, okay? So key A and B. And don't just, don't worry about trying to understand this right now. The, Video does a really good job explaining this. So um, again, we're just kind of high level. So it's gonna create two keys. One of them, I'm gonna keep private and I'm not gonna share that with anyone. The, my public key, I'm gonna put out on the internet for people to see, okay? Because the problem with symmetric algorithms is you don't have a way, like if we're standing out in the tire pit and we're trying to share a secret, like we can't just, there's no way for us to establish a way, a secretive way to talk, right? So how can I get you that key? There's no way for me to get you the key, right? Because we're, again, there's no, we're just outside, we're just talking. Whereas with asymmetric, 
I generate these two keys. I lock up the message with one and send it to you. You then take your public key and lock it up and send it back to me. And then I'm able to unlock my portion, which says, hey, I have permission to do this. We actually all generate, um, because we have all the parts, we actually generate mathematically when I have my public and private keys together, it'll unlock whatever it is that we're talking about. Okay, so again, don't worry about having it make sense right now. Um, the video will show actually how it works with Kool-Aid, which is actually really cool. Um, this is just a whole lot of math, like really, really high level math. Um, not even gonna pretend to understand it. Uh, but the great thing is you don't have to know how to understand it for the Security Plus. You just have to have a general understanding of how um, public key works. So in this case, um, when you think of asymmetric, it's that private or public-private key pair um, that you need to know about. So for um, the symmetrical, um, so that's where you have that pre-shared key. Um, what I would write down is just in your notes, um, private key encryption, you could do triple DES. Um, you don't, you're not really gonna have to know, like, I don't remember seeing any questions that specifically asked you like, what's the block size or how, how many bits is the key? There wasn't any like super technical questions on the Security Plus. You just have to know that these, um, Triple DES, IDEA, AES, all have to do with private key encryption, okay? Does that make sense? So on your notes, I would all I would be taking notes on this slide would be um, private key encryption, symmetrical, and then three DES, IDEA, AES. Because even AES has several different um, versions of it. Um, I think they might be up to 512, AES 512. Um, which is just remember when we talked about passwords, the longer it is, the harder it is for people to crack. So a lot of these algorithms, they'll start off with like a 64 bit um, key or like a password, if you will, and then they'll just keep getting bigger the more secure you want. So I'm gonna jump back to, um, because someone say, well, why don't you just always use asymmetric algorithms? Like if you're able to create a secure tunnel from the beginning to end and you can have this conversation, why don't, why do we even have symmetric algorithms? Well, when it comes to asymmetric, it takes a lot more processing power to break and do all this math, okay? So a lot of times these things will actually be used in tandem um, where you might use an asymmetric um, algorithm to like kick things off. And then once you guys have that trust established, everything will just be symmetric in between because you don't want to tax the processor. Does that make sense? So asymmetric has higher overhead, whereas symmetric is much faster. Okay, public key encryption. Um, so again, private is the one that we're holding close to us, whereas um, the public key encryption, that's where we are gonna create those um, two different keys, because again, this is asymmetric um, encryption. And honestly, I would say this is probably the most techie technical part of the Secure Plus, or Security Plus, is understanding um, encryption and cryptography. Um, so don't be discouraged if you're like, what the hell is all this? This is, gonna, this is just gonna be one of those things where you kind of make flashcards for, or do practice tests. Um, but I'd say this is probably the most technical Security Plus will get. <coughs> um, so uh, one of the first ones that were used was the RSA, um, which is the Rivest Shamir Adelman um, algorithm. And it used about 200 digits in order to, um, and it's still used today, um, in order to generate its key, um, or its keys, I should say. Uh, the one that you're going to hear a lot is Diffie-Hellman, uh, the Diffie-Hellman exchange. Um, because if you look up here, secure protocols such as SSL, TLS, SSH, and IP, IPsec. That's what makes the whole internet work are those four protocols. I mean, there's other ones too, obviously, but those are the ones that allow us to have encryption and um, confidential discussions or um, exchange information without anybody knowing on the internet. So Diffie-Hellman is definitely the one that is used the most. Um, if you're not familiar, SSL, SSL is what's used when you get the little HTTPS up in the um, address bar. Um, that means it's using SSL in order to encrypt that data. So that way, if somebody is sitting on your network sniffing, they're not able to see that information. <coughs> um, TLS is um, similar. A lot of times they're used in tandem um, in order to make sure everything's encrypted as it goes across the wire. 
Uh, secure shell is where, remember we talked about last time with Telnet, um, is a plain text protocol. So if you're using Telnet, anybody can see whatever you're doing on the, on the internet, whereas um, SSH kind of encrypts that. Again, nobody can see anything from the outside. And then IPsec is used for um, point to point or VPNs. Um, this is what I was talking about earlier with plain text. You have your key and then it goes into a cipher text and then you use your key again in order to use that plain text message. So do you understand just kind of the basics there of how encryption works where you have your plain message, you have whatever your key is, it goes again through that factory, then you have your cipher text that nobody can read. It's not until you apply your key again that that information or the key is applied at the other end of the um, conversation that you're able to read that. Does that make sense? Good. Okay. Yep. Yep. So again, at the um, at the whether they're using um, symmetric or asymmetric. It's that same idea. Um, we're gonna have our plain text. We're gonna use whatever algorithm it is to get a cipher text. And then at the other end, it's gonna have to, again, they're gonna be having their key or it was pre-shared and they're able to unlock it. Um, but this is the, um, this is kind of just the basics of how encryption works. And again, symmetric, more efficient, um, but asymmetric, um, is good at just small bits of information because again, it is a very processor intensive. Um, um, so I also put an application, or I'm sorry, a video up on Classroom that talked about how um, OTP works or one-time um, passcode works. So a lot of times when you like, even if you try to like log in your Amazon account, it's gonna say, hey, we're gonna send you a pin and then you put that in, okay? So in that case, I shared a video um, that kind of talks about how that actually works. Um, but it's the same thing where we're, before we go any further, we're generating that code and it's based on a time. So they you used to have these little, um, they looked like flash drives, they were about that big um, and they would be like on your keychain. So my mom had them back in the day um, because she worked with um, like, it was trade secret chemical um, recipes, if you will. So every time she would log in, it was this little, like I said, flash drive and it had a bunch of numbers on it and it would change every 30 seconds. It wasn't connected to the internet. It wasn't connected to anything. Um, it was just set to refresh every 30 seconds with a different six digit key. And then it would like, you'd see like a little ticker that that code was going to expire. So it's the same thing like we have today, but there are fit, there were physical RSA tokens, um, that organizations would pass out in order to make sure people are who they say they are. So if they didn't physically have that token and put in that key, then they wouldn't be able to authenticate into that domain. So with that, um, definitely watch that video because it is interesting to see kind of how the servers sync up. Um, it's not even, it might be two or three minutes even. It's a pretty short video, um, but it does a good job of kind of explaining um, how those work. Um, four protocols that... Um, use. We already talked about them. The only one that we didn't talk about, um, well, I guess two. So Ike is um, used for um, creating VPNs. Um, so that is the internet key exchange. Um, you won't really, on the test, you won't necessarily have um, what does Ike stand for or anything like that, um, but it'll be um, like what is, a, what is the um, algorithm that is used for IPsec for virtual, for VPNs. And then you'll have to, you know, put in their IKE. Um, so you just have to know which protocol goes with what type of technology. Uh, we already talked about SSL, which is when we're using cryptography actually within the web browser itself. Um, PGP is the one on the end. Um, PGP, you don't really see anymore. Um, back in the day, you used to have your PGP key like in the, like bottom of your email and people would then do that similar, um, similar thing with the keys in order to open up your email. So it was a way for you to make sure that, you know, your email wasn't, you know, someone couldn't just sniff the email that's going across the network, but anymore, we're now using a lot of web mail. Um, so we're depending on SSL more and more to do that encryption of the data. You don't really see PGP used very much anymore, but there could very well be a question that says, um, 
what could you use in order to encrypt mail on a you know Windows Exchange server? Might be something like that. Um, so you just have to know PGP goes with email. That's all you really have to know about it. Um, everybody know what, knows what VPNs are? Everybody understand the VPNs? Kind of what they're doing? Okay. Um, VPNs use IPsec. Um, so you probably learned about the OSI model and the TCP IP kind of stack. Um, IPsec is a very similar stack where there's a bunch of different protocols that are used in order to establish that um, point to point. Think of it like a tunnel going across the internet. Um, so you might have two different locations, one in Cleveland, one in Chicago, um, and they have to kind of work just like they're sitting next to each other. So what you do, you're not going to run a cable from Cleveland all the way to Chicago. You're going to use the publicly switched kind of internet. So what we do is we set up our routers in both of those locations, and then what we'll do is we'll use uh, whatever... Um, whatever internet service provider we want. And then from that, they are gonna, then gonna basically throw a bunch of switches and whatnot. Um, we're gonna establish that tunnel from point A to point B in order to make sure all of the traffic that goes through there is encrypted. So that way it seems like if I ping something that is in Chicago and I'm sitting in Cleveland, I should be able to ping it just normally. Like it's just part an extension of the network. And that's what uh, VPN tunnels allow us to do. So. Um, as far as what you need to know, um, you'll have to, I would definitely, um, when we talk about it later on as well, um, but I'll share another video that kind of breaks down the different types of VPN. Uh, but at this point, just know that IPsec is a suite of protocols that are used for encryption and it's what allows us to have VPNs on the internet. So this is something that, um, this next part talks a little bit about access control. Uh, we talked a little bit about this before, and I'm going to share um, a really good video about kind of physical access control, because that's the stuff that I really enjoy doing, uh, and just show you how easy it is to get through um, some of the physical stuff. Um, but physical access controls are actual barriers that are put in. So uh, we talked about, and you might have talked about this in, um, what is it, Foundations? Foundations. I always get the two Foundations and Fundamentals mixed up. Um, in the first class, you talk about like having um, an air gap or a place where um, you're stopping people from coming in the building. Um, you have locks on your data center door. You have, you could be biometric. Those are actual physical things that don't allow people to enter or exit the network. With logical access, that's where we're actually starting to use more of the technology suite in order to block people from accessing our data. So in this case, it might be like you have to log in with your username and password or your multi-factor authentication before you have access to that. And the final one is the administrative access control. So that's more of the policy side of things. Uh, remember we had that security cube and it showed how we had different um, facets of technology, or I'm sorry, information security, uh, where we had technology, that's gonna be your logical access control, Physical is obviously physical, and then administrative is going to be your policies. So that's the policies that we put in place. So that is your password has to be this strong. You have to change it every, you know, 90 days. You can't have, you know, the last four passwords that you used can't be used for your password, things like that. Um, those are the policies where we're trying to, I use the word control, um, but like control the users and what they're allowed to do. So we're not like controlling them, but we're controlling the policies that dictate what they're able to do once they hit the network. Does that make sense? Cool. I see some people taking notes. Just want to make sure. Check or hold, isn't that? Check or hold. We're good? Cool. Um, so we'll, let's break this down. So we don't, in the military, we just kind of have um, very much... Um, based on a role in the organization is what you have access to. But there are several different ways that can determine who has access to what. And I had talked about this before. Um, one of the things that you see on network, especially if they're understaffed, is as people have moved around the corporation, they haven't gone in and changed um, their permissions. And now this person has like super user access to everything, um, when in reality, they're just an executive secretary, okay? Um, so that's where these permissions kind of come into place. So this isn't necessarily um, just about like 
adding permissions to a file. Again, we're looking at very high level stuff with Security Plus. You're not going to have to drill in and set permissions, read, write, execute, anything like that, um, unless it's like one of the PBQs, the problem based questions. Um, but even then, it's not, they tend to not be um, specific to like Windows or anything like that. So the fact that the chances of you actually seeing a question like that are slim to none. You're just going to have to, they might give you a scenario and say, what type of access control would you use? Um, so mandatory access control or Mac, um, that's what we're going to do there is we're going to say this person here can or cannot access something. So this is just um, enforcing this specific person. There's just, they, they're just not going to do it. So it's just based on whoever that um, person is, is whether they can access. It doesn't have anything to do with their um, role within the um, organization. It has nothing to do with um, their rank, if you will. It just said it's a very black and white. Yes, you have access to it, or no, you don't have access to it. Discretionary access is whoever um, creates the object. So let's say there's a shared folder. Um, that person, then, if, if we're using discretionary access or DAC, that person then says who has access to it. Um, so like, for example, I created Google Classroom and I put out there who can have access to it, you know, with the use of using the link and accepting everybody into the class. I'm saying I created it so you guys can all join it. Um, if this was part of a university, it wouldn't be that, you know, it would be based on, no, you're in this class, so you have access to this and that's where that mandatory access, they specifically have it. Whereas because I created this class, I am giving you access to it because it's my object. Um, so you, I'm giving you access to it. Role-based is where um, based on the role that you have um, in the actual organization itself is what you have access to. Okay, so in our case, um, our CACs allow us, you know, certain access into certain things, uh, but like us trying to get into that military intelligence building across the street, I doubt that it's going to, um, I, it should not, I, I say doubt, but it should not allow us into that building. Okay. Because we don't have, it's not our role to be there. Okay. Just like, um, you know, trying to access certain websites and things like that. Um, our CACs aren't going to allow us that because we're not of that rank or that's not our job to do. Does that make sense? So that's going to be your RBAC, which is role-based. Uh, access control. Rule-based is where you actually set a specific level of rules. So what we have here, um, if I were to kind of abstract it, I think that the military adopts kind of both of these things. You have role-based, but you also have rule-based because we have these things called clearances, right? We have secret, top secret, and then there's like three more higher than that. Um, so with those, you're read into um, whatever a certain mission is, or you're read into um, kind of how that institution, however that basis. So when you go to your first duty station, um, and if you're working with like some higher level stuff, you have to be read into, which means you have to be like told kind of what we're doing, but then also you are now going to have the rule based that you've been read in. So now not only do you have this clearance, but you've been read in and this is your role. So it's kind of a combination of the two that allow us to get access to what we need to have access to. Um, the differences between the two are um, rule-based has what are called ACLs. Who can tell me what an ACL is? What does it stand for? Yep. That'd be like on your firewall of, if you're using this, this port and this uh, port call, you can't connect to my computer. Mm -hmm. So an ACL is an access control list, and it says, like you said, traffic coming from this port has no access. So let's say we are just being DDoSed on our home router. Um, we pissed somebody off in Fortnite, so, and they're sending a DDoS attack. Well, we can go in there and create an ACL on our router that just kills any traffic that comes to that. Or if it's a website, let's say they're trying to take our, down our website, we can have an ACL that drops any of that traffic so it doesn't allow it to come on. Um, same thing is true with um, like files and permissions and folders and information. We can set up an access control list that says, hey, if this person is of this rank in this location and the box that says has been read in is checked, then yes, they can have access to this information. Does that make sense? Cool. 
Uh, so identification, um, we already know how to ID. We already talked about that last time. Um, but this says, hey, you are who you say you are. Uh, we talked about this last time too, uh, as far as different forms of multi-factor authentication. Um, remember, you can't have two of the same thing. They have to be very different. Um, so something you know, something you have, something you are. Um, you can have something like kind of the geolocation. Sometimes that's used. Um, but those are the main ones. So if you see any questions that ask about multi-factor, um, just think about, you know, have A, that has to be two different things, and B, um, it's going to be something you know, something you have, something you are, <coughs> or it's based on geolocation. Authorization, I feel like we went pretty in-depth with this stuff. If you want me to go over it again, let me know, uh, but I feel like we spent a lot of time last time on the uh, AAA framework. Holy crap. Um, different controls that you can put on data. Um, so the first thing was giving access uh, to the actual resource. So that was the, you know, the RBAC, the MAC, stuff like that. Um, this is actual controls. So with controls, our goal is to keep information safe. So there's a couple different things that we can do. First of all is preventative control, okay? So if we see something that weird happening, like 2 a.m., there's a file that just, a huge file or a bunch of files that are transferred to a flash drive, like what the hell is going on? We're going to put something in place to kind of alert us for that. Um, so for like the Edward Snowden issue, you know, he was able to download a ton of information onto a flash drive, or I'm sorry, onto a memory card and put it inside of a Rubik's Cube. We probably should have monitored that there was this huge data dump from someone that, you know, didn't necessarily have access or shouldn't have had access um, to that information. Uh, deterrent controls, the word deterrent, we're trying to deter somebody from doing something. Um, so in this case, uh, a lot of times you'll see this, um, like at school, we have the warnings that come up if you try to go to like something you're not supposed to. Okay, so that warning that's coming up there is supposed to be a deterrent. Just like if it was a physical, you know, if we're looking at physical security, putting that sign out front that says this is protected by ADT or um, cameras in use, anything like that, that's a deterrent control. We're trying to, to deter people um, from accessing. Whereas preventative, we're going to try to stop it from happening. Deter means we're going to um, put things in place to try to stop it from happening. So preventive is um, keep it from happening. Deterrent is um, discouraging people from doing something. And finally, detective controls is where we're actually doing that kind of monitoring phase. We're watching our network to see if there are any anomalies or transfers or anything that w could be um, deemed as being unauthorized. I'll give you guys a moment. A couple other controls, um, you have corrective controls. So let's say something happens, it'll allow us to react to that happening. So in the case of corrective controls, we might go and say, um, you know, we're gonna shut down this user's account because it could have been compromised because they shouldn't have been doing X, Y, Z, or they shouldn't have had these sporadic logins from all over the US at about the same time. Um, so corrective control would be, hey, this happened, so we need to, um, now that we see this threat, we're going to try to go through and correct it. Um, recovery is after something actually happens. We are then going to try to, um, so in, instead of like with a corrective control, we're trying to correct it right now. Like it's happening right now and we're trying to correct it right now. Whereas a recovery control is there's some type of damage that happens. So let's say, um, malware spread throughout the company and it was ransomware, recovery would be stop anything further from happening. We're going to shut everything down, stop, and then we're going to pull from our backups. So this is a recovery control that we would have in place in order to get kind of back up and running to a smooth state. And the last one is um, compensative controls. Um, compensative, I've never... I've never like written into policy anything that would be um, necessarily I'm trying to think of an example of like what a compensative control. Um, 
because compensative is like your overall security posture, your security policy, um, in order to, um, I have like no good examples. Um, so compensative would be, so let's say um, something isn't possible. So we're not able to put, uh, make every single user have a 32 character password, okay? Whether administration says that or we realize that that's just really silly to make users do that. So a compensative control would be like, okay, well, since we can't have this really strong password, then we're going to enforce multi-factor authentication, okay? So we're compensating for maybe not getting as strong of an area here. We're going to go through and put this other control in place to compensate. So we're not just going to ignore security and allow them to have weak passwords. We're going to still make it really easy for the user, but we are going to have this other part, this, you know, whether that's a one-time passcode, a text message, some other type of multi-factor authentication. Does that make sense? Or we can't afford to have um, a guard standing at every single door here, right? We just can't do it. So a compensative control would be, okay, then we're going to use a badge system in order to badge in, okay? We can't change the way the layout of the hallways are or something physical about this building. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to do this other temporary thing in order to make it work. Okay, so that's what your compensative control would be. Okay, obscuring data. Um, so what you need to know as far as like the actual um, security plus is you need to know that steganography is hiding information in plain sight. So um, whether that's a music file, video file, the JPEG like I showed you earlier, um, that's what's going to allow you to, or on the actual test itself, it's going to be what technology would you use in order to hide something in a JPEG image. You just have to know that that's steganography, okay? And what is that word that starts with an O that describes hiding data? Obfuscation. Yep, obfuscation, absolutely. Absolutely. Data obfuscation. So we're trying to make them confusing, ambiguous, and harder to understand. It should look really scrambled. So if somebody picks up this piece of paper, they're walking down the um, sidewalk, and it's just this bunch of gobbledygook, it's because we use some type of secret um, passphrase in order to you know, understand what that is. They should pick it up, not be able to read it, and kind of throw it away. It's the same thing when it comes to digital as well. Um, somebody sniffing on the network should get this large random set of data and see no value in it, okay? Yep. Obfuscation, yeah. Yeah. Just kind of to break it down when I kind of compress it. Yep. But you can just go to the website and unobfuscate it. There's no like key you need. So encrypting it is just kind of. Yeah. So in that case, so when it comes to like their obfuscation, and you'll do this a lot when you're starting to like, if you're going into the attacking side of cybersecurity, um, they're going to use standard protocol. So it's going to be a certain length, like an MD5 hash, for example, and you'll be able to go to. Um, there's a bunch of different websites, um, but you put it in there and it'll auto guess based on the length that it is. Because there's only, let's say there's 10 128-bit key protocols out there. Well, it's going to try those 10 and it's going to see what type it is, like as far as that obfuscation. Um, but yeah, for like the web app type of stuff, um, that's meant to be just like a very low level stop bot type of traffic. Um, but when it comes to actual encryption, like you have a key and like you're actually encrypting that data. And unless you have that key or brute force that key, um, you're never going to make your way in. Whereas with just like steganography, there's no password. Like there's a bunch of steg tools out there that automatically scan um, files to see if they're RARs, if they're zip files, if they're seven zip files, like it'll go through and try to find them. Um, so even steganography is not necessarily a great way to... Um, like it shouldn't be something that you use for like business more. It is like something I would much rather have steganography than nothing at all. That would be, and I mean, and that would be very low level obfuscation 
whereas the high level obfuscation would be the ciphertext where we actually used our really strong um, encryption algorithms. Make sense?